Uh, I'm Adam, uh, this is Rob, and we're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so talking about spinnaker internals. We'll talk about how they've changed year over year and what some of the motivations have been. We'll touch on what operations looks like at Netflix, and in particular, some of the challenges and wins that we've had over the last year. Many of those have made their way back into investments in core, in Spinnaker core, that are available to everyone in the community. Rob and I both work at Netflix, and we're, member, uh, we're members of a platform team that ultimately has responsibility for Spinnaker operations, uh, performance, reliability, and extensibility. We're the team that's on call if there's a Spinnaker incident, an availability impacting incident. We're also members of, of numerous Spinnaker governance uh, committees. Uh, we're both on the TOC, the Technical Oversight Committee, uh, and Rob chairs that group. At Netflix, we're part of a larger organization called Delivery Engineering. And that org has ultimate ownership around Spinnaker. But earlier this year, the Resilience Engineering team came and joined us. So not only do we have responsibility for deploying software to production, we also provide the tools, the platforms, and the experiences that engineers throughout Netflix use to help their system behave better under failure. Chaos Monkey is an early incarnation of that. More recently, they've built something called the Chaos Automation Platform, where engineers are able to go and set up self-service experiments to deploy their, their systems in degraded states and test the impact. And a lot of that is delivered through Spinnaker. This talk will touch on three large themes. Certainly, we'll cover the evolution, how things have changed since we gave a similar talk last year. Operations have been getting much better. We'll talk about the challenges that led to uh, where we're at today. And we aim to not do things in isolation. We believe in the community, and we strive to to take what we build and implement at Netflix and, and upstream it to the community. We talk about things, we blog about things, and we write code that anybody can use. We'll look at where we're making investments, both strategically and tactically. If we were to give a similar talk like this at Spinnaker Summit next year, it will be curious to think about, will it be on the same subject? Will we be talking about the same challenges? I hope not. I don't know if we'll have a lot of time for Q&A at the end of this talk, uh, but there's an there's a open Slack channel right here. We'll share the slides in there, and Rob and I are happy to make time to answer any questions. Uh, just reach out. Enough with the preamble. So when I think of evolution, I think of growth. And when I think of growth, I think of numbers. So let's take a moment to reflect back on where Netflix has been and where we're at today. So when I spoke at the first Spinnaker Summit back in 2017, Spinnaker was well entrenched at Netflix. It was used by most of the engineers at the time, a much smaller set of engineers than we have today, but we also had a number of critical services that had integrated with Spinnaker. We had a number of um, API customers that were dependent on the data that we were surfacing. Through to last year, we continued to grow. We did encounter some scaling concerns, which led to last year's talk that was largely around um, overcoming the first set of those. We talked about running more complicated topologies, uh, how we manage Redis replicas and chain Re Redis replicas off of Redis replicas to allow us to scale. We did hit a bit of a wall. Interestingly enough, just after last year's Spinnaker Summit, and we, we, it, took a, it took a couple of months to get through that wall. It kind of lasted until early, early Q1. And Rob will touch on some of, the, uh, some of the strategies that we used to overcome that. Suffice to say, we, can, we are continuing to grow. And these RPS numbers, these are, these are not large by any means, but they're indicative of stickiness. These are front door requests to gate, which if anybody's familiar with the internal um, uh, topology of, of Spinnaker, uh, they're, they're blown out to all the uh, internal microservices. 
And if you're currently emitting metrics to uh, a telemetry system, uh, these metrics are available uh, here. Here's the query that we're using uh, internally. And anybody should be able to get this style of, of data out of their Spinnaker uh, usage. In terms of performance, this is where we're at right now. This is just an arbitrary uh, trailing seven days look at all calls to server groups. Fairly representative of expensive calls that the UI is making and API customers are making. And if we were to look back a year ago, we would see averages on the order of 20, 30, 40 seconds uh, under a healthy state. When degraded, we could, we could uh, spike to over 60. And if anybody's familiar with how uh, the Spinnaker services communicate with, another, with one another, you might realize that, hey, there's a 60 second network timeout by default. And when we were spiking over that, chances are the originating side was retrying some of those requests. Just throwing more fuel on a fire and further overwhelming services that couldn't handle the base load. Fortunately, we're well through this and we're orders of magnitude better across the board, both for large services. We have some services that peak at 40,000 instances in a single application. And we also have some services that run thousands and thousands of clusters. Those traditionally have stretched us on different dimensions. I mentioned stickiness. I believe wholeheartedly that a successful Spinnaker in an organization is sticky. It has integrations with other systems in your company. That's very prevalent at, at Netflix. Here's a few examples. Um, we, we have a number of custom auto scalers that are both retrieving a lot of data from Spinnaker, but also making a lot of uh, orchestrated changes. If we look at the usage of Spinnaker, broken down into people, so real humans, engineers, member, members of the product community, on any given day, 750 people interact with Spinnaker through the user interface. <coughs> this does drop on the weekends, obviously, uh, we don't have a culture of deploying on weekends, uh, making a lot of changes off hours. Chances are this 125 people are operators. Uh, maybe they've gotten paged and they're directed to Spinnaker to take a look at their service. What's interesting is the API integrations. We have much less of them, but they are fairly, fairly consistent day over day and growing quarter over quarter. Netflix is still all in on AWS. The majority of our deployments are to VMs running on EC2, but there has, been, there has been continuing growth on the container side. And all of our containers are deployed to Titus, a Netflix built uh, container orchestration platform. And it, runs, it itself runs on top of AWS. We're deploying upwards of 10,000 times to EC2 VMs and 6,000 times uh, with containers. Now there's a bit of a caveat here. Uh, deployment is a new server group created. And because we're deploying to multiple regions and multiple accounts, there is some uh, double counting here, or triple counting. We're certainly not pushing 16,000 pieces of, uh, of new code. There's been a lot of growth in accounts, certainly on the AWS side. We've gone from 20 in 2017 to upwards of 70 now. And if anybody's familiar with CloudDriver internals, you might realize that this poses some scaling concerns with the way that we do indexing threads. For every account, region, and cloud resource, we're creating a new thread that needs to be scheduled. So in this case, we're probably trying to schedule 12 to 1,500 indexers at any one time. So it is a concern on how much farther we can scale this. The current approach is to scale horizontally and use a dial which lets us adjust how much concurrency any single <coughs> instance can handle. This is an opportunity that we might invest in into the future, but also an opportunity for the community to get involved. And certainly Spinnaker as an orchestration platform does a lot more than deploy to the cloud. 
We push client JavaScript assets to CDNs across the globe. We push firmware updates to the devices that house the content that is streamed to your house or your devices. We run nightly smoke tests. Many teams run nightly smoke tests. We do data processing jobs. And I break the, cat the category of this work into two groups. That is that repeatable, so you can think of them as uh, imperative stages that are triggered based on some event, and those that are ad hoc. So things that are reactionary based on some uh, external stimulus. We run more than 40,000 pipelines a day. And the vast majority of these, more than 90%, are internally triggered. So the things that are run in crons are kicked off on the completion of some other pipeline event. Ad hoc is where it gets interesting. There are a number of declarative systems at Netflix that are orchestrating, uh, orchestrating intents through Spinnaker. Managed delivery is one such thing, but we also have custom autoscalers that are maintaining their own model, and when they detect a change, they are triggering tasks into Spinnaker. And we run more than 100,000 of those every day. I think we spike, uh, in terms of concurrency, upwards of five or 6,000 concurrent um, tasks or pipelines at, at kind of peak during the day. But last year, it felt like we were walking a tightrope. At any one time, we could fail. We could fall off. We didn't have that much headroom. And in fact, we did. We failed fairly catastrophically in terms of looking at the load on our team. We were uh, constantly firefighting. And as the team that was responsible for performance and reliability, it was very stressful. And of course, we had this fine fellow to keep us, uh, to keep us uh, on the ball and, and awake, during the day at least. Uh, the pages typically do subside overnight uh, as usage drops. Uh, but looking at numbers, over the last year, we've been paged a little over 300 times, our team. Uh, the vast majority of these were during that uh, period of, of crises, kind of December through December through January. The last six months, operations have improved. Rob will touch on some of the investments we've made to drop it. We've been paged less than 50 times over the last six months, and we're now on track. We get a page every week or two. Our team runs a weekly on call, and a lot of the pages we're seeing now are not self-inflicted. They're not performance related. There's something else in the system degrading, a downstream dependency failing, which still manifests itself as something behaving abnormally in Spinnaker. So we get paged, we triage it, and we work with our partner teams. Spinnaker is a critical service at Netflix, certainly one of the most critical services in the developer flow. We couldn't just tell the company, hey, stop. Sorry, we can't handle the load. Uh, go find another service. Come back in a couple of quarters when we fix things. Jokingly, we refer to uh, the mean time to a user telling us about a problem. And that's during the workday, certainly, measured in single digit minutes. Oftentimes, we'll hear about a problem from a user before our alerts even fire. We've got a very passionate user base who has very high expectations. They expect Spinnaker to be a product. Whereas as a team responsible for Spinnaker, we're aware of all the pieces that make, it, that make it up. And that's where we feel we can make improvements. But our users, they want something that's performant and reliable. The operators in all of us, we want Spinnaker to be operable. We don't want to have uh, many different dials that we have to tweak in particular orders we don't want a very complicated production topology that we have to artisanally deploy. We want something simple. And that's been a major focus of our investments in Spinnaker internals over the last year. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Rob, who will walk us through these improvements and what the impacts have been. Hi. So yeah, complexity hurts. Uh, Spinnaker is a very large system made up of 
from an open source perspective, about 10 microservices, but internally at Netflix, it's more like 20. Um, each service has its own data store and its own unique operator story. Uh, to keep things, to keep up with uh, performance demands, we tried stretching the architecture, like Adam mentioned, with uh, federating out Cloud Driver into upwards of 50 instances, and I think we had 12 Redis servers uh, backing it. Um, and before long, the topology started to look a lot like a Rube, started to look like a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, and when you are, when you're operating a, a service, you can only hold so many things. And when it was last year, right after Spinnaker Summit, we we were trying to hold all these different limes. And while we were trying to hold these limes, one would drop. And if we went to go pick one up, we would drop more. Um, a few war stories and kind of our our most common issues were uh, sourced in Redis. Either Redis was, Redis is a single threaded application, so any operation that's happening is going to block. Uh, so we have to, we have to either spread that load across many services or many servers of, of Redis um, or, yeah, actually that's about it. Uh, but. Redis has this issue of not being a durable data store. So when you start expanding out its memory, it might go out of memory and then it flushes all the data that's in it. And that could result in Orca losing all of its state. And that means that pipelines that were running are now just magically not there. And anything that was in the process of deploying would just be left in this half languishing state and operators would have to come in after the fact and clean up what uh, Spinnaker left on the floor. Um, we also had issues of greedy applications. So Adam was talking about uh, API users, these auto scalers. Sometimes they would hit us with upwards of a thousand requests in a second to say, please run these thousand pipelines all at the same time. And that would cripple the system and then hurt other users of, of Spinnaker. And Often cases when these larger uh, requests would come through, that would bog down the system and then make the UI um, slow and sometimes totally unresponsive. Um, it, was, it was time to tidy up Spinnaker. Uh, delivery engineering can't scale linearly with, with the rest of the Netflix engineering organization. If we're to be successful, we have to scale sublinearly. And to do that, simplification is really the only way forward. And what we decided is that the future is primarily SQL. Uh, for anyone that's been operating <coughs> Spinnaker in really any capacity, Redis is, is hard. It's, it's very hard. If you want to have a, a service that is stable, that is reliable, having it all built on top of a data store that is largely ephemeral presents some interesting uh, operational complexities. Uh, we decided to choose SQL rather than any other data store like Cassandra, even though that's a more paved path thing because it's, it's more efficient, it's more familiar for the entire community. Um, and in adopting Spinnaker, we were able to reduce uh, the footprint of our individual services by quite a lot because we were able to make uh, individual queries more efficient. And so we'll be moving in 2020 towards getting all the different services to use SQL as its backend store. Um, we've already done that for Orca, CloudDriver, Front50, and Echo, partially. So we have a handful of other ones that we still need to, to migrate over, and the intent is to deprecate uh, and eventually remove Redis and the Blob Store implementations as they provide an inferior operation experience. So tidying up our services is one thing, but as Adam mentioned, we've seen tremendous growth in Spinnaker and it isn't slowing down. If anything, the usage will continue to hockey stick and especially with managed delivery, will enable Netflix to turn down its last major competing uh, deployment tool, meaning that we will hockey stick even more in usage. With that, we've needed to 
make some large strides forward in, in performance. And with that, SQL again. Uh, Redis is very fast. Query to command to command, it's extremely fast. You can't really beat it. But it's not very efficient. Most of the data inside of Spinnaker is uh, relational. And trying to model relational data inside of a key value system um, is difficult and is actually very inefficient. Uh, there's been comments since last year that the way that we implemented SQL inside of Orca was kind of weird or maybe wrong, but we implemented it in such a way that we knew would scale to the performance numbers that we need while still providing all of the um, durability and correctness that SQL provides for everyone. I have some numbers right here. So Redis, for example, inside of CloudDriver, we saw um, a 3.3 queried key efficiency for retrieving cache data. So let's say you're looking at a server group inside of the, um, inside of the CloudDriver API. We would query a whole bunch of information inside of Redis and then only use 3.3% of those keys. And then that actually converted to, um, since it's a key value system, we have to kind of scan over all these possible keys and that translated to about a 4% efficiency of key hit rate. So that's a lot of effort that we're going through for not a whole lot of information that we're getting back. Uh, while SQL is slower query for query, it's far more efficient and then in aggregate is much more performant. We also have done some uh, more tactical work around uh, force cache refresh. If you're familiar with this, it's this kind of nebulous task that's happening inside of random stages that's, that takes like seven minutes or whatever. Uh, and we had, we had theorized that maybe some of these are not actually necessary. So we have disabled force cache refresh successfully inside of Netflix for all of these different stages uh, and subsequently have increased performance of these stages um, quite a lot. We want to make, these, make this the default, but it's kind of a scary change to put on users because if it isn't actually correct, everyone's operations experience is going to plummet. So right now they're, uh, they're done through configuration. So if you want to experiment with this, uh, we'll be adding some documentation that you guys can uh, play around and, and give us some feedback. Going fast is well and good, but it's often not useful if things fail. Failure happens even when you don't plan for it, or rather, it, failure happens even when you do plan for it. Distributed systems are phenomenally hard, and it's even harder when you're orchestrating distributed systems that you don't even own. At Netflix, as we've continued to scale the tolerance for failures from our customers, that is, other Netflix engineers, has dropped as it becomes more adopted. People are less tolerant of issues coming from Spinnaker because it's such a critical system. So we're actively working on refactoring the architecture between Orca, the orchestration engine, and CloudDriver, which is the service responsible for interacting with all the cloud providers, and to make that interaction more item potent. Uh, we've integrated a new saga pattern, which if you're familiar, or rather if you're not familiar, is a design pattern for doing transactionality across a distributed system. And so we're able to start a stage, let's say a, a deploy operation, and regardless of transient errors underneath, like let's say inside of Titus or inside of AWS, CloudDriver and Orca will no longer just fail because there is a throttle rate limit or anything like that. If it's a transient error or even a long-term failure of 30 minutes, CloudDriver can, or Spinnaker, can recover automatically without affecting the end user. Right now, this is Titus only, um, and we'll be looking to add this functionality in the EC2 and other cloud providers next year. Um, this was just released in, um, in Q4 here, so it's it's still pretty new, but we've already seen it uh, successfully 
um, avoid issues in two or three hundred pipelines at this point, which is quite a lot. Even if it's even if we're doing thousands of deployments a day, that's two or three hundred times where a customer doesn't have to come to us and say, "Hey, this pipeline failed. It left us in this weird state. Why?" Uh, and this feature is also only available for the SQL persistence backend. So that will just be another uh, encouragement for people to get onto SQL. Of course, it could be implemented for Redis. Um, it's just, it hasn't been. Netflix is widely known for its uh, mantra of freedom and responsibility, and Spinnaker, as it exists today, kind of reflects that. Before, uh, before Fiat was introduced, the authorization service, people could go in and do anything they wanted. It doesn't matter if their application was owned by them, some other, some other engineer could come in and delete a cluster. And this was true for Netflix with our thousands of applications and thousands of engineers. Anyone can go into anywhere, let's say the API cluster or the API application and delete everything. That, they have the freedom to do that. It's not very responsible, but they could do it. Um, and we really wanted to reduce our operational overhead. We have one Spinnaker to manage all infrastructure at Netflix, but then this one small little Spinnaker installation for managing our PCI compliant uh, um, account. We wanted to merge that so that there would be a single Spinnaker to rule them all. So we adopted Fiat in the beginning of the year. And through this, we have improved performance and res uh, resilience of Fiat itself, as well as Spinnaker in general. If Fiat were to, for some reason, disappear, or its Redis were to uh, die, it won't kill all of Spinnaker, which initially when we were adopting it was something that we had seen. Uh, and through security audits that we've gone through, we have now consolidated everything into one single Spinnaker installation. So even our PCI compliant accounts are all managed through a single Spinnaker and people are able to secure off certain applications that are only allowed for people that have gone through background checks and that kind of thing. And as Adam mentioned again, we have a steady growth of machine traffic. APIs and Spinnaker are uh, polymorphic, they're dynamically typed, and as a result, relatively difficult to discover. For anyone that's tried to write an API client with Spinnaker, the usual workflow today is load up the UI, run a pipeline with the network tab open, and then inspect whatever was sent across the wire, and then copy paste that into your code and rinse, repeat until you get something that works. We are looking to switch to gRPC for inter-service RPC. Um, and as a result, that will mean that we'll have to have stronger typing for the actual individual services of our services. And as, as we continue to build out the inter-service APIs internally, that will bubble out to a public API that's strongly typed, discoverable, and potentially sprinkled with some event streaming, which is a very common request. Let's see. And then extension. There was already a talk on Spinnaker plugins earlier by the Armory folks. Today in, in Netflix, we use open source Spinnaker, but we layer things on like a cake. And like a cake, if you want to add a new layer, you have to do that at bake time. You can't just add another layer onto a baked cake and expect it to work. So, <laughs> unfortunately, that kind of, that kind of development process um, requires some aptitude of the JVM, uh, Gradle, and just building this entire service. It's a very complex system, so adding all, having to know like Spring Boot and then all the internals of <laughs> Spinnaker, that's, that's quite the mountain to, to, that, to climb if you're not working on Spinnaker day in and day out. Even if you are working on Spinnaker day in and day out, it can be arduous. 
So we're working on a plugin architecture. And that means that custom builds are not necessarily needed. We are working on the capability of adding a, pl a plugin jar that sits aside like next to the Spinnaker service that gets loaded at boot time, configured, and then siloed off into its own class loader. If you're unfamiliar with class loaders, it's the way the JVM finds code. Uh, and the value of having the plugin code separate into a separate class loader is that it prevents um, dependency conflicts. You can add your own dependencies without breaking the actual core service and that kind of thing. Plugins will also support um, alternative runtimes as well, so remote plugins. You could kind of think of this as the webhook stage or uh, pre-configured webhooks today. Um, just totally separate processes that are running somewhere else, but that adhere to a uh, strict and stable interface inside of Spinnaker. So you could say, I want to create a cloud provider. Well, that cloud provider, mm, let's, say, let's say ECS, for example. Amazon wants to create an ECS cloud provider. Well, today, people have to make a bunch of pull requests into CloudDriver, Orca, Gate, maybe, well, maybe Gate, uh, DAC, all these different services, get it approved by people inside of the core contributors, and then continue to iterate, like with everyone having to accept the risk of some nascent code getting into Spinnaker. With plugins, they'll be able to develop that all out of band, make it stable, and then there could be the potential of bringing it into core. Or maybe it just stays out in a plugin forever and Spinnaker itself can just stay stable with the ecosystem growing exponentially out without needing to know the JVM. All right, so all these internal changes are well and good, but what if disaster strikes? What if this creepy girl sets your house on fire? <laughs> We're working on multi-region. In, inside of Netflix, we already have two data centers for, for our production Spinnaker installation. They are running in active-active. So we have a Spinnaker deployment in uh, US West 2 and a Spinnaker deployment in US East 1. They can both receive production traffic, although one is only responsible for uh, processing triggers and that kind of thing. Uh, but this is a relatively new development for us. Inside of Netflix, if, if your service becomes unavailable because of a regional outage, that's a pretty bad look. Most services inside of, inside of Netflix are designed to be cross-region and active-active across all those. And the fact that Spinnaker wasn't active-active across regions was causing some uh, heartburn for us. Like, when will US West 2 die and then Netflix loses the capability of operating the production services. That's, that's a big deal. So having these two regions now has actually already saved us a couple of times now. Um, and it's been, it's been very valuable. Right now we are just using traditional SQL replication um, and they're totally isolated. So if a pipeline execution goes into data center one, it'll stay there forever and will replicate the data to the other region so that there's still visibility if you were to land in that other region. Um, but we're starting to experiment with CockroachDB for certain specific use cases, such as front 50s durable storage, where latencies are less of a problem. If there's a problem inside of Spinnaker, chances are high that we've already seen them and cut our teeth on it. Operating Spinnaker is not easy, there is no easy button. But we do have some recommendations. Spinnaker is a critical service. If you are running it, you need to treat it like a critical service. And a critical service will always have monitoring, it will always have dashboards, it'll have alerting and centralized logging. It kind of seems like this is a, a no-brainer, but it's very common when when people are asking inside the Spinnaker uh, open source Slack that people don't have these things set up. And 
having these set up will make it much, much more easy for us to help you in whatever problem you're having inside of your Spinnaker installation and also just help yourselves. There's a plethora of errors that could possibly happen inside of Spinnaker and being able to centrally log everything and see um, all, all log messages for a particular request or a particular pipeline execution is immensely helpful when debugging a customer support issue. Great. Easy wins. Migrate to SQL. Like I said earlier, it's available for Orca, CloudDriver, Echo, Front50, and other services will follow. All these migrations do not require downtime. As Adam mentioned, Netflix is not going to wait for us to stop. We have to do everything. All of our changes have to be done live. And there's migrators for everything, and there's documentation for all these services. One key thing to take away from this is that Echo is now, um, its scheduler is now highly available, which is a uh, change from the Redis era where you could only have a single Echo instance running for doing scheduling. Now you can have as many Echo schedulers as you want and it'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> Investments. First thing is Spinnaker as a platform. In 2020, we're gonna be focusing immensely on this concept of Spinnaker as a platform, and that is adding extension points so that people can create plugins, which enables federated inner sourcing. For that, it's, for us, it's, we as a delivery engineering organization are a central service that people want to integrate with, but we don't wanna do the work for them, which has historically been the case because of how it's a layered cake development process. And we also want to enable extended experiences, people to build higher level abstractions on top of Spinnaker and the primitives that we offer. We also want to simplify the developer experience, not only just for us, but also for the community. We've already added some things in terms of coding standards, but we want to go deeper. We want to have more static code analysis. We want to have better testing tools. We have, want to reduce and consolidate dependencies. Spinnaker is built on Spring Boot, so we want to get rid of dependencies that kind of duplicate functionality that Spring Boot already provides. We want to simplify things as much as possible so that it's easier for people to get in and get started. And then managed delivery is another major, major part of the future of Spinnaker, and that is through declarative infrastructure, declarative delivery, and managed delivery. I'm not going to go over this because there was a talk earlier, uh, and I'm also running short on time, but check it out. So Spinnaker at Netflix in 2020. We're going to be focusing on Spinnaker as a platform. We're going to continue consolidating around SQL. We're going to continue making operational improvements and that is going to most prominently be seen through uh, auto generation of configuration documentation as well as metrics. So people will be able to actually know what all these flags that are secret sauce for Netflix um, without having to sleuth through code. And then we're also focusing on a concept of secure by default where uh, authorization models enabled by fiat are just enabled by default rather than being an opt-in thing. Let's reiterate, the incentives and motivators for this is operational simplicity. The less time that we spend fighting fires and less time we spend just maintaining the status quo means more time that we can be developing features and delivering value to our customers inside of Netflix. And that goes the same for all of you. And also organizational stickiness. The more you can customize Spinnaker to meet or to integrate with different systems inside of your organization, the more valuable it will become. Spinnaker out of the box is uh, kind of a freemium sort of thing. It, it does a lot of cool stuff, but it isn't anywhere close to the power that you can get if you tightly integrate it with other systems inside of your organization. And through all this, we're hoping that we'll get more increased OSS contribution. For us, selfishly, we have open source Spinnaker because it's, a, it's filling a gap that really didn't exist inside of the open source community. Um, and it's a bet that through your contributions, we'll be able to get innovation that we never would have even dreamt of. 
And similarly for all of you, more OSS contributions means the same thing. You'll be able to get innovation that you wouldn't have been able to get by doing it yourself. Ways to keep in touch. Uh, special interest group participation. If you're interested in literally anything that was mentioned in here, there's a SIG for it, especially the internals bit. There's a new uh, platform SIG, which covers all kinds of things. There's a new SIG that was just proposed, I think today, around operations. Uh, there's a SIG for UI, UX, managed delivery, security, all kinds of things. Um, the Technical Oversight Committee has also started a new experiment around an open forum where people can just come and talk to us, uh, voice concerns, ask questions. It's totally open. Any question is fair game. And then meetups and conferences like this, and then next year, Spinnaker Summit 2020. Thank you. So we got about five minutes left for the, the next keynote starts. Did anybody have any questions that they want to ask? Uh, so thanks for the for the presentation and for all the details. So in terms of uh, the Spinnaker and production, right? It's a critical piece of the infrastructure. Uh, can you share a little bit about your RTO, RPO, uh, and a little bit about the DR process, if you have considered those things? The DR process? Yes. And the, the time to recovery in case of uh, mm, Okay, so that's, that's pretty complex because each individual service is going to have its own uh, mean time to recovery as well as its own disaster recovery uh, story and hopefully through consolidating around uh, SQL and adding more admin endpoints and that kind of thing, we can kind of simplify and make that process a little more homogenous. Um, since we are in a more active, active capacity now in, in terms of regions, uh, mean time to recovery would really be evacuate another region, which is a DNS change. So however long it takes for the DNS to propagate so that people are no longer hitting the old service and then enabling like Igor polling, for example, and pub sub uh, processing inside the other region. And that's a configuration change, which is instant. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. We could definitely do better as far as um, disaster recovery game days. And that's something that our team is interested in doing more frequently on a regular basis. Uh, because every single time we've done a game day, We've come on way with a lot of learning and, and subsequently a more stable service. We have designed the the services to um, take advantage of the MySQL query, uh, query optimizer. So we're not sure what the performance characteristics would be if you were to transfer it to, say, Postgres or, or anything else, but it should work. Um, since we're doing the CockroachDB uh, experimentation, we've already noticed that in Front50, for example, some of the ways that we had designed the schema was not exactly uh, compatible, so we've had to make a few modifications there. but it should work, maybe with a little bit of elbow grease, but we've only tested it with MySQL. So the performance is optimized for MySQL? It is, yes. So we... One more. When you talked about the extensibility of like plugin architecture, you mentioned class loaders uh, and the JDM and stuff. Historically, like, are you going to avoid class loader leaks? I'm not an expert on that at all. Um, so knowing that I'm not an expert, we, we decided to adopt PF4J, which is a very well battle-tested uh, plugin framework that's used in um, solar, for example. So it's, I can't give you a really good answer other than we're standing on the shoulders of people that have already cut their teeth on it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs>